activists, a coalition of over 100 organizations working in Washington on federal criminal justice policy reform. <music> of the round table is his working groups. And that's where strategy is discussed, brainstorming uh, is done, and we can really, really get down in the weeds. And that's the lifeblood of the Justice Roundtable. But the round table is more general uh, public gatherings for those who aren't necessarily enmeshed in the day-to-day -day work of the uh, working groups can still get a feel for what is happening and what is going on. Justice Roundtable was the catalyst behind the passage of the Second Chance Act in 2008. Sentencing Reform Working Group helped to usher in the passage of the Fair Sentencing Act, which reduced the disparity between crack and powder cocaine. And our commutations and pardons working group worked very closely with respect to the Obama era clemency uh, initiative, which resulted in the uh, release from unjust incarceration of over 1,700 uh, people. The fact that we have come together this evening, um, brought together, we got the call from the Justice Roundtable and we all responded. And it couldn't be a more critical and important time for us to, to share an evening like this, but be together under one roof, reminded that we are all in this together. Welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Nikichi Taipa, Nikichi Taipa Esquire. And I'm just trying to see if my pen is working. Just one second. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the Justice Roundtable Quarterly Assembly. Justice Roundtable, coalition of over 100 organizations and individuals uh, working to reform federal criminal justice um, policy uh, issues and also on the state uh, basis as well. We've been in existence, can you believe it? 19 years, 19. We're about to go into our 20th year of um, existence. Again, I'm Nikichi. And you know, today is December the 1st. And it was on this date exactly 66 years ago, that civil rights activist Rosa Parks did what others before her had done. She defied the laws of the United States and the law of Montgomery, Alabama by what? By refusing to give up her seat on a city bus to a white man. And for that, she was arrested. And indeed, Claudette Colvin, the pioneer teenager who months before Rosa Parks believe it or not, is still on parole today from her 1955 conviction for refusing to give up her seat on a bus to a white man. On parole, on parole, folk, for 66 years, or at least she never received notice that she finished the term and was on safe grounds legally. So now at age 82, Claudette Colvin is in the process of seeking expungement from that to clear her record for refusing to give up her seat on a bus to a white man. Now I bring this up because for far too long, true history has been buried. And as I am famous for saying, it is past time that we open up these caskets. We open up these caskets of injustice that have been buried for so long and bring history into the light. Because until we do so, injustices will never be rectified and we will never heal. And that's a great segue to the feature part of our Justice Roundtable Assembly this morning. We're gonna have an interview with my friend and colleague, attorney Jeffrey Robinson, executive director of the new Who We Are Project, former deputy legal director uh, and director of the ACLU Trone Center for uh, Justice, 
Jeffrey has opened up some caskets, y'all, and he has just produced a slam dunk must-see documentary about race and justice in the United States. We're gonna first view a very brief trailer to the documentary and then go right into our interview before we proceed with the rest of the Justice Roundtable Assembly. So let's have that trailer for the Who We Are documentary. If you have ever owned a slave, please raise your hand. Slavery is not our fault. We didn't do it. We didn't cause it. But it is our shared history. Slavery had nothing to do with the war. And so if I make the statement to you, America was founded on white supremacy. Lynchings or hangings took place here. It's a genocide. It's an ethnic cleansing. The bodies were dumped all the way where the underpass is, and they intentionally put the interstate on top of their bodies. It's ingrained in my memory. I'm just looking at him in the ditch with his eyes open. My daddy sat on the carport right here in a lawn chair with a shotgun across his lap because he was going to be ready if somebody came to the house. Wow. There must be a revolution of values in our country. I cannot look at that video in its entirety. And my brother did not deserve to die unarmed with his hands in the air. It will never get easier to have an honest discussion about race in America than it is right now. Because if we wait, it is only going to get harder. Greetings, Jeffrey Robinson. I am just so thrilled that you are here with me uh, today discussing this phenomenal project that you are the CEO and the subject slash star, shall we say, of the Who We Are project. But you know, I know you from the ACLU uh, when you were the uh, director of the Racial Justice Project uh, there and just kind of been following you. Tell me, what is this film? This film that has been described as, let me just get it right. It's been described as a documentary that is part TED Talk, part cinema, part expose, and a 100% reckoning. Tell us just what this is, how you happen to do it, <laughs> and, and just what we can expect. Go on, rock and roll. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for having this chat with me. The film is called Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America. And it was born out of work I started doing back in 2011. As the film explained, my wife's younger sister uh, lived in Queens, New York. She was a single mother raising her son with her mother. Uh, and my wife's sister passed away. And then her mother passed away all within several months. And so Matthew, our 13-year-old nephew, became our 13-year-old son. And he moved from Queens, New York to Seattle, Washington to live with us. And my wife and I didn't have kids. So all of a sudden there's a young black man in my home and all of the issues of race that I had been dealing with as a criminal defense lawyer since 1981 became much, much more personal. And I was afraid because I had never raised a child before. And I started reading. I don't even know what I was looking for. But what I found were facts about our history that I had never been taught. Facts that escaped me as a student at Marquette University and as a student at Harvard Law School. And I started to collect these facts and put them into a presentation. And I was going around the country doing this presentation. And when I got hired at the ACLU as a deputy legal director in 2015, I continued to give this presentation. And in April of 2017, I was giving the presentation to lawyers and judges in federal court in Manhattan. And one of the lawyers in the room was a woman named Sarah Kunstler, daughter of the famous civil rights lawyer, William Kunstler. And Sarah and her sister, Emily, are also filmmakers. They called me two days after this presentation and said, this presentation is powerful. We think it should be a film. And I started laughing out. And one year later, 
On Juneteenth, 2018, we were in Town Hall Theater, a Broadway theater in New York, in front of a packed audience. We filmed the presentation. And for the next three years, we traveled around the country with me giving my presentation in different cities and then meeting people whose lives had connected with the true narrative of anti-Black racism in America. And by filming those people and talking to them, we put it all together. Sarah and Emily are brilliant filmmakers, and that's how we came up with this film, Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America. Well, you know, Jeffrey, that is absolutely awesome. And I remember the first time I saw the presentation, it knocked me off my feet. I remember exactly where I was. I was in the Kennedy, the Kennedy Center. Yeah, it was at, at the some type of um, uh, uh, event. I don't even remember what the event was, but you were like the luncheon speaker or something along those lines. And I remember my colleague, Jocelyn McCurdy said, you gotta hear Jeffrey Robinson. You gotta, you gotta hear this, this speech. I mean, he is, Nikichi, you gonna really, you are gonna really like this, Nikichi. And she was absolutely right. I mean, I was just awestruck and dumbfounded because it wasn't about the facts. Cause you know, I know a lot about black history and all like that, but it was the matter in which you present it, the manner in which you put all of the different elements together, the manner in which you went step by step, point by point, making sure that all strata of American life could understand and hear just what you were saying. And I know it started out with, um, well, at least the film, I saw the film started out with uh, you having a conversation with a white supremacist. You wanna tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, we went to Charleston, South Carolina to film because, uh, as you know, the vast, vast, vast majority of Black Americans can trace their heritage to Charleston, South Carolina in terms of where people came from the Middle Passage because Charleston was a major port in the southern part of the country. So it was one of the, the biggest ports and one of the first places where uh, a ship would land. So we went to Charleston and we were very, very interested in what was happening in Charleston. And activists told us that there were white supremacists that demonstrated in on the waterfront every weekend. And I quite frankly was sick. I had gotten sick while we were there. It was a Sunday and I was in the hotel in bed. And Sarah and Emily called me up and said, We've got this guy down here who's willing to talk. He signed a release. You've got to come down here. So I pulled myself out of bed and I went down and had a conversation with this man. And uh, many people have asked me, weren't you angry or weren't you agitated by what he was saying? And of course I was. Um, but I've been trained as a criminal defense lawyer. And I used that training which taught me if you are challenging what somebody is saying and you yell and scream and get emotional, then it breaks down into a fight. But if you can stay calm, then the other person has to stay calm. And if you put facts in front of the person that they have to agree with, then you'll get to a place in the conversation where you may not get I think this man was waiting for me to start screaming at him and calling him a racist. He talked about moral, M-O-R-R-I-L, taxes that the North was imposing on the South. I think when he says that to many people, they have no idea what those taxes were, but I did. And so I told him, yeah, I know what those taxes were on cotton, tobacco, and rice. And he's saying, well, yeah. And we talked about how they were produced. And he had to admit that it was at least 95% by the labor of enslaved people. And, and so I was simply talking to him and trying to put before him facts that I knew he would have to agree with. And I think if you watch the film, you'll see that by the end of the conversation, he's on a bit of shaky ground because he didn't want to talk about how many enslaved people were responsible for all those crops and all that money. He didn't want to talk about that. And so he tried to change the topic. And he said, well, they were treated like family. And that's a myth. 
they, it's part of the lost cause narrative. It's part of, well, slavery wasn't that bad because the South were, were the Southern people were kind and gentle to enslaved people. That's just not the truth. And I was able to, as opposed to screaming at him, rely on my training as a lawyer. He just said something that makes no sense whatsoever. So what can I say to him to demonstrate that? And what I came up with was, well, then it would be okay if I own you, as long as I treat you like family. <laughs> and he couldn't acknowledge that. He said, do you mean in today's world? And my response was in any world. And then he said, do you mean in today's time? And my response was in any time, because he was looking for a place to make an exception and I wasn't gonna give it to him. And he finally said, no, I wouldn't be satisfied with that. Yes, I do have to admit slavery is evil, but this Confederate flag has nothing to do with it. And that's where we ended the conversation. And I will tell you, I shook his hand. And there were times when I talked to the directors about taking that out of the film. Because remember, a lot of the film, all of the town hall portion, and a lot of the interviews we did, this is like three years ago three and a half years ago. And there's so much that has happened since 2018. But I shook his hand because that's what you're supposed to do when you're having a conversation with another human being and then you're separating and the conversation has been civil. And so I shook his hand and I hope that what people get from that is that there can be conversations on the issue of race where you don't give an inch Absolutely. in terms of what you know and believe to be true, but you can put something into somebody else's mind by trying to talk to them as opposed to screaming at them. I'm not saying I changed this man's opinion on anything, but I made him think, and I'll tell you what else, the camera didn't show it, but there were a lot of people standing around listening. Yes. And they, I guarantee you, had not heard that kind of conversation in front of that Confederate monument before. And so those people had to go home and think, huh, what do I make of that? And it's those moments when people are saying, huh, I didn't know those things. What do I make of that? Those are the moments when you can get somebody to do something or to think about something that they've never done before. And, you know, Jeffrey, the beauty of all of this is, is just as those people were standing around and nodding, huh, I never thought of it that way before. Now with this film that will be hitting this, the, 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 the big screen, I think in January or February, you'll let us know about that in just a moment. So, so many more people will have the opportunity or talk to say, hmm, I never thought of this before. And you know, you're you're here, we, we, we're, we're in front of the audience of the Justice Roundtable, which deals yes. with justice system reform and transformation, okay? And I know throughout the film, you know, you talk about the, the slave patrols and the, 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 the that was the predecessor to uh, 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 the police today. And you talked about the um, uh, cases, some of the cases of Eric Garner and Terrence Chuck, John Crutcher, and we talked about the, the war on drugs with John Ehrlichman, just how that all came about with the Nixon administration, and the Clinton Klein bill, and mass incarceration, and all these things. Just touch on a couple of those that you might want to share with the Justice Roundtable to just dig just a little bit uh, deeper on any of those areas, or all of them just very briefly connected together. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that one of the uh, most important concepts in this film and one of the most important concepts of the Who We Are Project, the organization that I've now launched, is uh, found in the words of George Orwell in his infamous book, 1984, who controls the past, controls the future. And so if you look at prisons today, and you say Black Americans make up about 13% of the population, but just over 40% of the prison population. So either we are more criminal, more willing to break the law, less willing to live peacefully with each other, or something else is going on. 
And it's that something else is going on issue that is lost in history. And so understanding that the purpose of the laws passed by colonial America and by constitutional America up until the Civil War were to keep Black people in the condition of being enslaved. That meant that when we ran away, someone would go and catch us and bring us back. If we talked back to a master, we would be physically punished. These were things that were seen as normal and natural. And when the South lost the Civil War, do you really think that in 1865, when the South uh, conceded and surrendered, that all of those white supremacist ideas just went away? They didn't go away. They stayed right where they were. And so the South, in particular, started criminalizing Black life with Black codes, with Jim Crow laws, with putting Black people in jail around the time that elections were held. Because if you're in jail, you can't vote. And then the states decided, well, we can come up with something called felony disenfranchisement laws. And if you look at the history, you will see that right after the Civil War, states with large Black populations started passing disenfranchisement laws so that people couldn't vote if they were convicted of a crime. And in states like Maine, where they had small Black populations, they were getting rid of those laws or they never passed them in the first place. And so this was an attempt to use the criminal justice system to disenfranchise Black voters, because we might be not slaves anymore, but if you can't vote, then you are weakened in terms of your ability to participate in the political process in this country. And so police departments were developed, especially in the South, out of slave patrols. And there is a huge amount of historical writing about this. Why is that important? Because the job of the police from colonial America through constitutional America has always involved the control and suppression of Black communities. Article four in the constitution made it clear if a black person who is an enslaved escapes, they have to be returned on demand. That means literally black attempts at freedom in the United States were unconstitutional until 1865. They were literally unconstitutional. So police departments that were born out of slave patrols and that were born to regulate and suppress Black communities took Jim Crow laws, Black codes, and other things and continued to do that. People say we have all these problems with policing, but Nikichi, go back 102 years to 1919, the Chicago uh, quote unquote riots where a young black man is killed in Lake Michigan because his raft floated to the white side of the lake and the white people threw rocks at him, knocked him off his raft and he drowned. There was an uprising. And after it ended, there was a commission and they wrote a report. 1932 in Harlem, another uprising. There was a commission and they wrote a report. 1967 in Detroit, there was another uprising. There was a commission and they wrote a report. 1992, after the Rodney King incident, there was an uprising and there was a commission and they wrote another report. And if you put all four reports side by side, they are saying exactly the, the same, same thing. thing. There is racism in policing. It is rampant. There are two justice systems, one for white people and one for black people. They're all saying the same thing. So when we look at the issues around policing and the criminal legal system today, it is important to understand that history. Because if you don't understand that history, then you may be saying, well, 
let's pass a law saying that the police can't kneel on someone's neck. That will solve the, solve the George Floyd problem. And as you and I know, that won't come, that won't move an inch towards solving the George Floyd problem. The problem is not kneeling on someone's neck. The problem is that police, in that instance, in front of video cameras, mm -hmm. took nine minutes to choke out somebody's life, whether they were kneeling on his neck or had an arm around his neck or put the car tire on his neck. How they did it is not the point. That they did it is the point. And so when we look at reforming policing, we have to look at the history of policing to understand how we got to where we are. And that's what we have never done in this country at any significant level. That's why you have $10 million that the Obama administration put into the Minneapolis Police Department to give them de-escalation training and other things. And this was before George yeah. Floyd was yeah. killed. So understanding the history in this country, understanding how police departments were formed, understanding what jobs they were given when it came to the Black community, understanding the narrative that all of us are criminal and dangerous. If you don't understand that, then when you're trying to reform policing today, you're going to come up with solutions that are just uh, ice cream and, and cake frosting, and they're not going to do anything to change the real problem. So let me just um, ask you this, Jeffrey, because we happen to be having this conversation. This, this um, uh, conversation is being recorded for Justice Roundtable, but we happen to be having it today on the very day that Kyle Rittenhouse was uh, acquitted of all charges. I'm just uh, curious, you talked about there was a system for Blacks and a system for whites. Do you have any just off the cuff, we didn't talk about this in advance, but any off the cuff, uh, very brief uh, commentary with with respect to that because it kind of is like smack in your face i mean i don't know just curious what are your thoughts uh i was expecting this verdict from the behavior of the judge and uh uh so but my gut was ripped out this morning when i read it and i can't say i'm surprised because i'm not I am heartbroken. I am physically ill. If a young black man had been carrying an AR-15 on the streets of Kenosha that night, mm -hmm. he would be dead. dead. Absolutely. We wouldn't have had any kind of a trial. Mm -hmm. And this is simply an indication of how far the criminal legal system will go to protect those who are in the majority. In the majority, and when I say majority, I mean controlling majority. White America, Kyle Rittenhouse is set free. A young white man the other day who was convicted of four sexual assaults of high school girls was given no jail. Now, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I think that there are very, 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 very few people that need to be in jail or prison in America. But what keeps being demonstrated is that the criminal legal system can find a way to see humanity in a criminal defendant as long as that person is white. Right. Then they can find the humanity. The kid Brock Turner out in Stanford who raped a young woman was not sent to prison. A judge saying prison won't do him any good. It'll just ruin his life. But when young black men come in front of that judge, that narrative isn't there. You need to go to prison and get punished. And if it's gonna ruin your life, well, your life was pretty much ruined already. So I'm not taking that much away from you. So, uh, there was a, a song I used to know from my youth, and one of the lyrics was, I used to be disgusted, now I try and be amused. Well, I'm not amused at all, and I am disgusted 
but this is who we are in America. And this is what makes the work that the Who We Are project is trying to do, the work that the Justice Roundtable is trying to do. This is what makes our work so critically important. We are at a tipping point in this country, a critical tipping point. We were there at the form formation of constitutional America because the colonies were awash in slavery and we were forming the constitution. We didn't have to continue it, but those folks got together. They looked at the money that was on the table from slavery and they said, oh yeah, we are doubling down on this. And then six provisions, at least six in the constitution protect the institution of slavery. At the end of the Civil War, Reconstruction was working. There were 2,000 Black men who held elected office before the 15th Amendment was passed. Those enslaved people had been in the starting blocks, and when somebody said go, they took off because they were ready. And what happened then? In the election of 1876, the Northern troops were withdrawn from the South. The South started to reorganize uh, Confederate soldiers under groups like the KKK, Black Codes and Jim Crow laws. And once again, we rolled right back down. Yeah, tipping point. In the 1960s, in the Civil Rights Movement, I'm 11 years old when King gets assassinated. And to my young eyes, all I had seen up to that point was the bus boycotts. We were winning on buses. We were winning at lunch counters. We were desegregating schools. I thought we were headed toward a racial reckoning that would, that would take us to a whole new place in this country. And then King got killed. And what came next was Richard Nixon and the war on drugs. That is three tipping points. We have experienced as a nation and each time we rolled back. A tipping point in a country that is 400 years old, it doesn't, it's not a second or a minute or a year. It's as long as a decade. We have been at this tipping point since 2016, and we are wavering back and forth over is the ball gonna roll back or are we gonna head in a different direction? So the work that the Justice Roundtable is doing right now is critical to the future of our country. If any of us have children or nieces or nephews, this is what this is about. What kind of world are they going to live in? And we are the ones who are going to decide which way the ball rolls this time. So, you know, as we're coming to a close, you're absolutely correct about these tipping points. And we're at a tipping point right now. And now your film, this phenomenal film, Who We Are, a Chronicle of Racism, I think it is, in uh, America, is coming out at this specific time of a tipping point. Tell us when it's going to come out, how folk can plug in to it, how folk can see everything that I've seen, because I was able to see a preview, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's not just a, 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 a story of facts and figures. It's a very human story also. And it's the human story told through your personal eyes. And it is extremely, extremely, extremely riveting. So tell folk about when, Thank you. how, where, and all that. So Sony Pictures Classics has purchased distribution rights to the film, both uh, here in America and internationally. Uh, they are promoting the film for an Oscar. And, you know, who knows what will happen there, but they are doing great work. The film is going to premiere in America, in Los Angeles and New York on January 14th, the Friday of Martin Luther King's birthday weekend. It is going to have a theatrical run throughout the country uh, in major cities all over America with uh, hopefully the pandemic won't stop that from happening. And it will go to streaming services later on in the fall or, uh, or the winter of 2022. It's going to premiere January 14th, 2022, and then later that year, it will end up on Netflix. So people are going to have the opportunity to see it. It is called Who We Are a chronicle of racism in America, not the 
chronicle of racism in America, because it is focused, Nikichi, on us, on Black Americans. And there are other stories of racism in this country that we could tell. If I was telling the chronicle, this movie would be eight, nine hours long, and it would still only be a summary. I'm focusing on the experience of Black Americans. And I think what we can learn from that can be applied to all other kinds of issues that we have in this country. But I am very proud of this film. I do have some personal stories in this film. And what I would say is, many people have said to me, and I, I say in the film that my parents were unicorns for what they were able to do to give their children a better chance at having a successful life. What I wanna make clear is, I was not singling out my parents or me as anything special because you know, and quite frankly, everybody on the Justice Roundtable knows that there were nothing but unicorn black parents throughout American history who were always finding a way to make a dollar out of 15 cents, a way to get their children into a better situation than they had been in. So while my parents are you know, near and dear to me, my story is what it is. And it is simply, simple, simply an example of the kind of things that Black Americans all over this country have been dealing with for centuries. Well, thank you so very much, attorney and counselor at law, my brother, <laughs> Jeffrey Robinson, CEO of the Who We Are Project, writer and a producer, and the subject, aka star, of the <laughs> upcoming film, Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America. Thank you so very much for joining the Justice Roundtable. Nikichi, thank you for having me, and please keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, we both got lots of work to do, so let's take care of ourselves over this holiday season, but then buck up and saddle up, because we got a lot more coming. All right. Who We Are, peace and blessings. Wow. Woo! <laughs> that was surely riveting, but I must say so myself. I really want to thank Jeffrey Robinson for this fabulous interview. And we all look forward to his January 14th release date. In fact, <laughs> it would be great if there were an organization or a philanthropic entity who may be interested in renting out a theater, uh, particularly in the DMV uh, area and providing tickets for the DC justice advocacy community. That would be phenomenal. If there's any interest, please be sure to reach out to me and I'll make sure to let Sony Pictures know. So, you know, I'm looking in the chat and I'm seeing uh, 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 all of these phenomenal organizations that are connected with the Justice Roundtable. Uh, who are part of this uh, convening this morning. I see Fear and Just Prosecution. I see the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard University. I see uh, uh, the Danbury 100. I see Cure. I see the National Network for Justice. I see Heirloom. I see the Open Society um, uh, Foundations. I see the Innocence Project. I see Due Process Institute. Uh, I, I see Church of Scientology. I see Colorado Cure. I see the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, Drug Policy Alliance, uh, 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 Center for Employment Opportunities. I see the Collier Collective. I see the Vera Institute for Justice, the University of St. Thomas at uh, Minnesota. I see the Center for Policing Equity. I see the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Oh my goodness, the Sentencing Project. I see TAS, T-A-S-C. I see the National Urban League. I see the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, the National Criminal Justice Association, the Festival Center, the Center for Justice and Human Dignity. Oh my gosh. Innocence Project, Safer Foundation, uh, uh, Center for American Progress. Oh, they just keep going on and on. Students for a Sensible Drug Policy, the Washington Statewide Reentry Council. I see the American Bar Association, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, Mommy Activists and Sons, the US Human Rights, the Federal Public and Community 
Defenders are in the house, Amnesty International USA, the Urban Institute, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. I see NAMI, N-A-M-I. I see the Racial Justice Institute of Time Banks USA, the Alliance for Safety and Justice. And uh, I, 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 I know that there is a more Freedom Free Minds Book Club, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, Human Rights for uh, Kids. Uh, oh. Lord have mercy. I just wanted to share because I know this is a webinar and everybody doesn't get to see uh, what I see and we're streaming live on Facebook as well. So, okay, I've diddled out enough. <laughs> the agenda says that I will have an important Justice Roundtable announcement to make. But before I do, I'd like to share some slides from some previous Justice Roundtable assemblies and events. Unfortunately, they don't reach all the way back to the very early days of the Justice Roundtable. Um, as technology then, talking about 19 years ago, it's not necessarily what technology is today. But I hope that it gives you just a little nostalgic flavor for our work over the past number of years. And then we'll have the announcement. So let's bring on the slideshow.
Talk about some nostalgia, y'all. Let me just do my spotlight. That was nostalgic. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I can't say it any other kind of way, shape, form, or fashion. So with that, let's just get right into it. <laughs> there has been a worst kept secret swirling around the Justice Roundtable for at least the past year. <laughs> And that worst kept secret is my decision to step down as convener of the Justice Roundtable. And as many of you all know, for the past year, I've had a whole lot of eggs up there in my basket. I published a memoir. I republished three of my children's books. They ended up on the uh, banned books list or whatever. I've been all over the country talking about the issue of reformations. <laughs> And I ain't no spring chicken, y'all. I mean, in fact, believe it or not, I shouldn't put all this business out here. But I was one years old when Rosa Parks sat down on that bus. Okay. And it is past time for a change. And it is past time for some new and some revitalized energy for the Justice Roundtable. And with that, I am so very excited to announce that upon my stepping down and passing the torch at the end of this year to two of my very best colleagues and friends who are no strangers to our work, who will take up the helm and in their personal capacities, they will bring the Justice Roundtable into its 20th year of existence. And I'm speaking of, I'm not gonna bring them up just yet, but I'm bringing them up in a minute. So I wanna tell a little bit about them, but I'm speaking of my colleagues, Cynthia Roseberry and Kim Boss Smith. Oh! They have both been stalwart, consistent, and have garnered both the respect and the admiration of broad sectors of the justice advocacy community. Cynthia Roseberry currently serves as director Deputy Director of Policy for the Justice Division at the ACLU. And for those who don't know, I kind of cut my uh, policy teeth at the ACLU way back in the day before I was at the Open Society. I was at the ACLU and we had a similar coalition um, back then in those particular days. But Cynthia, during the Obama administration, she served as project manager of the historic Clemency Project 2014, often referred to as the nation's largest law firm of nearly 4,000 lawyers providing pro bono legal support to more than 36,000 applicants for clemency. She also served on the Charles Colson Task Force on Federal Corrections. Previously, she was the executive director of the Federal Defenders of the Middle District of Georgia. She's taught at Deep Paul University School of Law in Chicago. She served as executive director of the Council for Court Excellence in DC and so, so much more. And she currently serves as co-chair of the Justice Roundtable's Commutations and Pardons Working Group. And Kimba Smith, oh, oh my God, Kimba. And you know, I'm saying a little background because we may presume that everyone in the Justice Roundtable knows who Cynthia Roseberry and Kimba Smith are, you really should, but I know some of y'all weren't even born <laughs> when Kimba Smith got out of prison. Some of you weren't even born at some of these key moments that we talked about in Justice Roundtable's history. So just bear with me for a moment. Kimba, growing up as the only child in Richmond, Virginia, had attended Hampton University, but what happened to her in her new campus environment was a nightmare. Led to a 24 and a half year sentence in a federal prison. In December of 2000, after serving six and a half years, President Clinton commuted her sentence 
to time served. And she shares her traumatic life experience, real life experience in her book, Poster Child, The Kimber Smith Story. Her story served as a vehicle very early on in the Justice Roundtable's history, educating legislators about the injustices of mandatory minimum sentences and the crack cocaine uh, debacle. And I will say it is Kimba Smith and her story that really opened up to where we are today with respect to the narrative on criminal justice uh, reform and in, in that narrative changing. Kimba is a graduate of Virginia Uni U Union University and a past recipient of Soil Justice Postgraduate um, Fellowship for Advocates. In December of 2014, she was appointed as a member of the Virginia Criminal Sentencing Commission by Governor Terry McAuliffe. She has spoken at the White House, testified before Congress and the United Nations. And actually you, well, um, you and um, Gay McDougall and others testified before the Inter-American Commission on, on Human Rights. It was the event that the Justice Roundtable uh, sponsored that served to put the issue of crack cocaine really back on the map that led to the passage of the Fair Sentencing Act um, several years later. But she's um, talked about issues, crack cocaine sentencing, mandatory minimums, drug sentencing, women and incarcerated, felony disenfranchisement, and reentry. So with that, I am proud that these two phenomenal advocates will be succeeding me as convener of the Justice Roundtable, bringing this groundbreaking coalition into its 20th century. And I'm about to do this thing to bring you all up, add spotlight and add, okay, I'm a Jackie here, Kimba and um, Cynthia. I'd like both of you all to say a few words. I'm gonna start with you, Cynthia. And then um, we're gonna just open up for open mic. If anyone um, has any words you wanna share, welcoming our, our two uh, new conveners of the Justice Roundtable. And I'm gonna ask members of my team, if, if folk can just raise your hand from the audience if you want to speak. And I think hopefully they'll be able to see who you are and let you speak. So first, Cynthia, share with us whatever you wanna share in terms of being a co-convener of our bringing it into 20 year old justice roundtable. Take it away. So Nikichi, thank you so much. This is such an honor to be able to serve in this way. And, you know, I'm mindful of the fact that we're not gathering in person as we uh, saw the montage, but we will gather in person again. I think about the foundation that you laid for the round table. It is indeed a round table. It's not a table with a head or a tail. It's a table where people sit around equally and share. And we saw that from, you know, the vi current vice president of the United States saying, when the round table tells me to call, I come to all of the others, including me who are on the other end of that spectrum, who are allowed to participate in this. And so I hope that um, and pledge to carry on the tradition that you've created of making it a round table, of keeping uh, it inclusive. Now, I am um, not the smartest person, but I want to show you a pair of shoes that belong to my cousin. They're a size 17. <laughs> and these shoes pale in comparison into the shoes into which I know I'm stepping now behind the Incredible, there are not enough adjectives to describe you, Nikichi, but behind your phenomenal work. And so I wanna be brief here because I know Kimba, my co-convener is jetting off across the world shortly and she needs to speak. But I'd like to just ask everyone if you would join with me right now and raise a heart. And this is the first of, the, of much of the love that we're gonna share. If you could raise a heart on your screen for Nikichi Taifa and the amazing heart and work that she's done to create and build this Justice Roundtable. Thank you. I look forward to doing this with Kimba and I can't wait to see where we all go together in the future. Thank you so very much, Cynthia. That just really warmed my heart. Kimba Smith, take it away, my sister. Nikichi, Nikichi, Nikichi. This is um, this is bittersweet. Um, I'm I'm like Cynthia said. Uh, these are big shoes to fill. I'm very excited 
um, about the opportunity in Nikichi, but goodness, we we go back so far and you said that this, you know, coming year will be 20 years for the Justice Roundtable. Um, December 22nd will be 21 years um, since I've been home. And Nikichi, you know, from you being at um, Open Society to the Justice Roundtable, you have always been um, supportive. And I recognize the fact that I wouldn't be who I am today um, as far as in the positions that I've been, I've been in had it not been for um, tables that you've created where I've been able to have a voice at. And I speak for myself and for the formerly incarcerated um, community and just watching that video um, brought back so many uh, memories and and you said it you know when I came home you know there weren't any formerly incarcerated people that were um, really at the table so I would just want to thank you for your years of dedication um, and work and in this time Nikichi I'm, I'm I hope that you will fulfill all your dreams and wishes um, but it's just interesting in this time and the pivot that I'm in, and I know you said in the beginning, you know, in my personal capacity, but for those of you all who don't know, um, I am a voting member on the Virginia Parole Board here in Virginia. And because of the uh, recent election, you know, more than likely I will be um, let go. Um, that's not confirmed, but I know that's what uh, Youngkin ran on was on day one that he was going to fire all the members of the Virginia Parole Board. But in that token, the timing of this Nikichi, because, you know, listening to Jeffrey Robinson and um, who we are in this nation, I, again, I'm not going to be long winded, but I am so very excited to have this opportunity to be co-convener co with Cynthia Roseberry. And it's just, you know, ironic that Cynthia Roseberry headed the, the clemency initiative and I was granted clemency from the president. And, you know, I've been in this position and haven't really been able to speak like I'm used to speaking. Um, so, Again, um, I'm just grateful and humbled um, to have this opportunity. I'm glad I was able to have this conversation without boo tearing up crying because, you know, again, I'm speaking from a personal perspective, but the things that I've seen and the things that I've read in doing this work and the position that God has allowed me to be in, um, it definitely has um, shined even a greater light and a greater weight of the work that needs to be done. And one of the things that um, inspired me somewhat this morning was watching the news and seeing this movie that Sandra Bullock is gonna be doing where her character actually um, killed a police officer and she's playing this character. So I can't wait and she's been released. And I guess it's the struggle of you know, her trying to move on with her life. I'm not exactly sure I could be making all that up, but the fact that Hollywood wants to focus on this aspect, the time is now, Nikichi. And I promise you from the bottom of my heart, and I know Cynthia, um, you have our word that um, the round table's in good hands and we wanna continue to fill this work. And it's a, I'm humbled to be able to work with all the many organizations that have been a part of this movement. So um, as Nikichi said, I will be heading off to, to Paris. My son is graduating from grad school in a few days who Nikichi helped support it when he was interning in DC. Um, but Nikichi, best wishes to you in the future, but you will only be a phone call away and you will still be <laughs> helping to move us forward. So thank you so much to you both. Thank you so much to both of you all. And I just want to also say, um, I guess as Kimber mentioned, that she likely will not be part of the parole commission um, after a very short a while. So as I mentioned before about the Who We Are project and organizations and philanthropic entities, organizations and philanthropic entities, we want to keep the Justice Roundtable uh, rolling. And conveners are gonna need support with respect to that. So you'll be hearing, I think, a little bit more uh, you know, about that, but um, hopefully 
um, particularly, you know, Kimba as a formerly incarcerated uh, person and, and helping to co convene this effort will be able to be 100% um, um, supported. And so I, I think that I saw some hands. Before I do, I just want to thank my a team. I want to thank yeah, Willie Brewer, who has been the person who has been responsible for all these videos you see and these slides and all like that. And I'm very appreciative of that because capturing history is important and a very uh, big part of it. Um, Aforawa Idawa, who has been uh, my right hand assistant and assuring that uh, those listservs were kept up and all the little techy things that I, I can't do. Uh, Lydia Curtis with Sadiqi Educational uh, Services. Thank you so very much, Lydia, for any and all that you have done. Uh, Jasmine Mickens, who was my assistant at the when I was at the Open Society. I couldn't have done anything that I did if it were not for uh, Jasmine. Uh, Andrew Mazel, if you all remember him, he was my assistant before um, um, uh, uh, Jasmine Mickens, and uh, he's currently a program officer and doing great things as well as Jasmine at the Open Society. Chris Scott, <laughs> we were partners in crime also with respect to um, at, at the Open Society with respect to these issues. And I don't know who remembers, if you remember this name I'm about to give now, you are really a Justice Roundtable OG. And I'm talking about none other than the phenomenal, indomitable Gene Guerrero, who through his perseverance and, and, and insistence really got that second chance reentry bill across the uh, 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 finish line and opened the Justice Roundtable up to real collaborations that we had not had before. Those collaborations did not begin uh, uh, with the first step act. <laughs> they were, were right-left collaborations reaching way back uh, from the prison rape um, elimination bill, second chance, reentry bill, fair sentencing, now far, far, far predating uh, that first step. Um, and then finally, to the Justice Roundtable conveners, co-conveners, um, co-chairs, co-chairs of, of the working groups, we could not do this work would it not be for you? And one of the things I said to Cynthia and Kemba is that it's the working groups that are the lifeblood of the Justice Roundtable. It's the working groups who are doing all of that work. And I saw my number one partner in crime on, on the screen uh, in the in the attendee list, Jesslyn McCurdy. I missed you, Jesslyn. But Jesslyn has never strayed up far. She's now with the leadership conference. She was with the um, uh, you know ACLU. And just thank everyone. So Lydia or forward, I don't know if we can figure out the techie, if you saw a hand raised or how we can do that to bring people on board who want to say a few words. Take yourself off of mute, Lydia, if you're trying to speak. And ask her, maybe I need to do that. And I saw and some I hands, I don't know how this hands. Who, who's speaking? Uh, Lydia, tell me, or a four, okay, how are, can we do this? There are, hands, there are six hands that are raised. I will go ahead and click on click them, uh, elevate them. Okay. Uh, Afori, I did make you a co-host, I think. Oh, no, I, I thought I did. Let me make it again. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, so we're bringing Jana. Who, who, who's, who's coming up? Oh, Jumana, Jumana Musa, a a Angeline Frazier Giles. Jesslyn McCurdy. Jesslyn. Ah! Let's call on Jesslyn for Jesslyn, where is she? Is she up? I don't see her. She's up. There she is. Jesslyn McCurdy. Go on and see. you got just brief Wilkerson. words welcoming our new co-conveners. I think she can did. you see me? Can you hear me? I can see and hear you. Oh my God. I cannot believe this day has come. Nikichi. Oh my God. I'm sitting here emotional to watching that video. It was brought back so many memories of the awesome work that you've done, that we've done, that this coalition has done. Like I said in the chat, you've changed this world, Nikichi. You don't get enough credit for that. 
you know, there are people here on this, in this call, on this Zoom, who would still be in prison today without your work. Um, you have worked so hard. You are such an awesome advocate. You will always and forever be my partner in crime. I remember uh, one of my first days at the ACLU when I started almost 20 years ago, the first thing Laura Murphy said to me, she wrote your name on a piece of paper and she was like, you need to call Nikichi. And, and ever since that, um, Nikichi and I have been um, friends, have worked together, we vacation together, if you ever vacation together with Nikichi. Um, and you are just so awesome and so important to my life. It is such been, it's been such an honor. And since I've, over the past couple of years, have stepped away from the, this work a little bit, it just, every time I come back, it just reminds me of how awesome this coalition is and how awesome you are. And I just love you. And Peace, peace and blessings for the future. Cynthia and Kimba, I'm so excited um, that you're going to be taking over this important work. And um, let's do it. Let's move forward. Love you, Nikichi. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Justin. Love you too. All right. So, oops, wait a minute. Okay, who, who are we bringing up next? I'm trying to figure out how to remove the spotlight. Here we go. Okay, who are we bringing up next uh, for Aurora Lydia? Well, I, I can see folk. Uh, Angela and Frazier Giles, I'm bringing you on up. Uh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi. <laughs> I just really want to say, first of all, Nikichi, your name preceded your greatness because I was doing some work with Advancement Project and I kept hearing your name and I was like, who is this Nikichi? I had first had just moved to the DC area. So I just wanna say you are amazing. And I tell you this all the time, you are just this and full of energy light that has just educated all of us and really supported all the work that I've done, all the work that all of these folks that are part of the Justice Roundtable, you are amazing. I don't want to say too many things. I feel like Kemba, I'll start, start to cry. Uh, Kemba, from the time I was at FAM, meeting you, just um, knowing all that you went through, hearing your story, even before I even started doing criminal justice work. Uh, I am so proud of you, so proud to see where you are today. So happy for you and your son who's graduating and your daughter who's doing amazing and your parents who are, you know, still here supporting and being there for you. Um, remember meeting them in Virginia years ago uh, and just how supportive they, they have been of you and your kids and your life and family and the work that you do. Cynthia, you know, what can I say? That first day when I was at uh, NACDL and you came into the office, I'm just so, so proud of you. Happy to continue working with you. And uh, yeah, you guys, Black Girls Rock, okay? And Black Lives Matter. And I know you guys are gonna take Justice Roundtable to beyond uh, where we could even uh, imagine. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, we're always, we're all here for, for you guys and to support. So peace. Thank you very much, Angela. And it's because of you that I've been able to keep my sanity because you helped to provide that, uh, uh, that solace that, that we need for self-care and taking care of ourselves. So thank you for uh, your initiative and you young those who know, know. I'll just leave it at that. I'm going to call on Sakira, Sakira Cook. Cause wait a minute, hold on. Let me bring my Sakira on up in here. There she go. Hey. Hi. <laughs> I'm Kiji. Um, so I don't know how many people know this, but uh, I've been at the leadership conference 10 years and that is all due to Nikichi. Uh, when I started, uh, I guess, 11 years ago um, in this work. I was in the Nikichi. I think I was her first fellow. I mean, she was, she had sworn off of interns and fellows. She didn't like them. She, 
<laughs> she didn't want to deal with it. She was like, I'm too busy. I can't be bothered with anybody. And uh, I know Nikichi. Actually, Nikichi has known me my entire life. Um, she knows my parents. I was at your baby me. naming ceremony. <laughs> she was at my baby naming ceremony. <laughs> um, many people probably didn't know that. But she has known me my entire life. And, and the way that we were connected as I got older and in a more professional capacity was due to my father <laughs> hounding her and being like, hey, my daughter is a lawyer now. She needs a job. <laughs> and so she took a chance on me, someone who hadn't had no experience, uh, just knew that I was passionate about these issues and, and really wanted to do civil and human rights advocacy work. And she was committed to, and I think this transition for her is still evidence of that. She was, uh, was committed to um, building a pathway for younger advocates and um, and just people, Black people specifically, Black women specifically, to enter into the advocacy space and to make space for them and to um, have them um, have their leadership, you know, sort of be be front and center um, as part of all of the work that she was leading for so many years um, and, and join her movement, right, <laughs> of, of bringing people together. And so I, you know, owe Nikiji so much um, for, you know, the work that I have been able to do, um, not only with her when I first started and everything that I learned from her and <laughs> when I first started and continue to learn over the last 10 years, you know, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, not only for what you've done with the Justice Roundtable, but especially what you've done for me personally. And I know there are so many other people who can say that you poured into them personally, professionally, um, and, uh, you know, are eternally grateful for you for that. So um, while we are sad that you are not going to be the mover and shaker that you've always been in the Justice Roundtable convening role. Um, you know, I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you are, you wrote your, your, your not first book, but your, your recent book and you're working on other projects. And I know this is, you're excited about what's to come for you in the next phase of, of your work and your advocacy. So um, congratulations on a job well done. And Cynthia and, and Kimba, I look forward to working with you both. Um, I have to share this little story. I, I read Kimba's story when I was in high school and it left such an impact on me. I remembered it. So when I saw her in person working for Nikichi, the first time I met her was when I was working for Nikichi. I was like, oh, this is like, a, you know, a hero of mine, like somebody who I, <laughs> you know, growing up kind of uh, looked to and, and appreciated. So I am looking forward to uh, continue to build on that relationship. Thank you so much and love you. Thank you so very much, Secure. We always love you. Oh, that feels so good. You're just so good. Okay, let's see. I think I saw Kara. Oh, we got to bring Kara up here. Kara got, hold on. Uh, the Sentencing Project. Hi, everybody. Um, I. Uh, I, everything everybody, I agree with everything everybody's Thing. I love the Justice Roundtable. It has been a consistent force and entity in my entire career, regardless of where I've been. And it is the most wonderful, nurturing, loving community of professionals um, that anyone could ever work with. And it was because of that, Nikichi who created that environment. She has been an immense mentor to me for 20 years. And similar to Jesslyn, I remember the first, my literal first day working in 2005 at the Sensing Project, Mark said, you got to go talk to Nikichi. She wants to do something around crack. And that was it. And after that, our partnership never ended. Um, like Secura, thank you, Nikichi, for everything you've done. It's just meant so much to me personally. And I know it's meant everything to this community to have you as our leader and guide and inspiration it's 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 been everything it's the reason why I stay in this work it's this community literally having colleagues who you can rely on and trust and be inspired by it makes the work so much so much better so much better and 
The Justice Roundtable has done that for countless other people. And I really think it's such an important community because it is all about caring for other people and, and training the next generation. And more and more people come in and they grow and they blossom and it's just so beautiful to watch. It's absolutely beautiful. So thank you, Nikichi, for all of that because that is all you, that's something you created. And with, with Cynthia and Kemba there, perfection. They will continue that perfection and build this community um, even brighter and taller. And I thank you all for taking on this responsibility because I know it's a big one and it is huge shoes, huge shoes, Cynthia. That is really good metaphor, but I know the two of you together are up for the task. You are already so inspiring and I know that you're going to do a great job. So thank you to everybody and for all that you do and all of your hard work. It really has made a huge difference. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And just don't go away for a second because when I was at the ACLU in the early 90s, when we were fighting against those uh, crime bills, that was the time when we had the first crack um, uh, coalition. And then after I left the ACLU and went to Howard um, law school to form a program there. There was a long law. There was a law. And then when I came back, when I came back to the forefront of criminal justice reform at the Open Society um, around in 2004, 2005, I really wanted to revitalize that whole crack co coalition. But people just weren't feeling it. I mean, it, it just, people just weren't feeling it. So, Carol, when you, and the sentencing project said, yes, we want to do this. That gave me the inspiration that I need. And that just wasn't just the inspiration because everybody knows me. I'm like, I go off on tangents. I do, I, 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 I'm kind of on the edge, but you gave it legitimacy. You made it seem that it was all right to bring up crack again and try to get those crack laws changed. And you know, we were bringing people, um, cutting and screaming with because nobody believed that it was going to happen. We're still fighting it today. But in 2010, something major did happen with the Fair Sentencing Act. And it served to bring a lot of people out of prison. We are still fighting that battle. But Cara, it really was because of you and the sentencing project and the legitimacy that you all brought that it was all right to really continue and re-up and make serious the advocacy on getting that um, um, law changed. So I just wanted to say, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm just going on, but it's just that um, there was no legislative real serious vehicle at that time, which is why we decided to have a thematic hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, where Kimba came and uh, Charles Ogletree, I was saying, Wade Henderson uh, 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 was there, and I don't even remember who all else, but it helped to, bring more legitimacy to put it back on the map. And then it just, the rest is just history. So again, Kara from the Sentencing Project, I just wanted to thank you, uh, you know, for that. Uh, okay, so let me see who else we got out here. Oh, Nicole, Nicole Porter, the Sentencing Project again. Let's go on and follow I just that. have to, yeah, and I just have to weigh in. I'm going to spotlight, and we need to, I'm going to stop talking so much, but we need to probably limit these to about one minute, but go on. Yeah, I'm going I'm to be quick. I just, I don't know if people realize it, but it's similar to Sakura. It's because of you, Nikichi, that I came to work at the Sentencing Project. You hosted a, you co-convened a conference in 2008, 2009 um, with Catherine Bean. You gave me a scholarship. I was looking at emails from that time last week, and you gave me a scholarship, didn't even know who I was. And I had shared an anecdote in the chat that when I was at the Texas ACLU, one of my colleagues at the time, this was in the mid 2000s, y'all, one of my colleagues at the time had printed out some of the information from the Justice Roundtable and said, we should start something like that here. So, you know, the Justice Roundtable, even when it got started, was influencing organizers, advocates around the country. And it's because of you that I even came to DC and I've been able to work and thrive at the Sinancing Project for over the last 12 years. So just like Secure, just like some of the other stories, you have poured into other folks, poured into the movement and so grateful for you and looking forward. I've already worked with Cynthia and Kimba, inspired by you all. And I know that the Justice Roundtable will continue to thrive. So looking forward to what's next and continuing to work with you, Nikichi, and whatever roles you take on next. 
Thank you so much, Nicole. And that was the behind the cycle project that we had that big, unfortunately, Yao wasn't with us at that time. So I don't have any videos and pictures from that, but actually some of it is on C-SPAN. Uh, C-SPAN was this, I need to go on and pull that footage up. So thank you for reminding uh, me about that. Uh, let's bring on Billy Wilkinson. Most of you may not know who Billy um, is, but uh, Billy is a more recent colleague of mine with the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights uh, Clinic and the Movement Lawyering Clinic. And we just did a wonderful project together. How are you doing, Billy? Talk to us. Like, part of how we doing, everybody. I'm seeing some warm and friendly faces. I'm so happy to be in this circle today. Um, I, I, I wanted to congratulate uh, Kemba. Um, and um, I, I, wanted, I, I just remember when I was in a, a student in law school uh, reading about you. So I'm excited to be able to meet you in person at some point. And Nikichi, congratulations to you. It is such an important thing when you um, create a space and then you're able to step away and allow someone else to transition. That is actually something that is a very difficult process for people and for organizations. And Cynthia, congratulations to you too. But um, I just wanted to say congratulations to everybody. I can't talk too long. I'm actually with my newborn grandbaby. <laughs> oh, that is. <laughs> Literally two weeks old. Because <laughs> oh, I, I, I didn't recall you being pregnant. Oh. Than a person, but um, yeah, I, I'm excited to catch up with everybody, and I'm excited about the projects that are happening at the Thurgood Marshall Center this year and the collaborations that we can all have. So it's great to see everyone, and I'm I'm really excited about the the new um, documentary that you were just talking about. So that uh, all of it, I love it all, and, and and congratulations to each of you. Okay, thank you so very much, Billy, and I'm going to bring up Cynthia. Oh, oh, wait a minute, hold on. I'm going to bring up Cynthia Robbins next, but hold on, I'm trying to get my, uh, okay, here we go. Just call me the Miss Techie here. I'm very we impressed with you, oh, Cynthia Robbins. I'm very impressed by your techno <laughs> proficiency. Uh, and and I'm, I, I want to just echo and, and uh, continue the celebration uh, air, because I am another person who um, came to the Justice Roundtable as I was leaving the, the directorship of um, the Maya Angelou uh, Sue Forever Schools. And I have to say, Nikichi, in her generous, open, warm, invitational self, invited me to um, the Justice Roundtable when Open Society was still over on, what was that, 19th or 20th Street? Uh, 19th Street. So it was early, but not at the beginning of the Justice Roundtable. And, and what I have to say is that that spirit of generosity, of diligence, of um, pers per perseverance and resilience has undergirded the growth of the Justice Roundtable. And I am sure that you have planted the seeds and, um, and let the roots grow deep. Uh, and it's manifest in all of these people who are uh, just overflowing with these commendations and the, the celebration spirit. We need that celebration spirit because the fight for justice is hard, it is long, it is exhausting, and it requires us to remain energized and encouraged. And you have been a great, inspiring encourager. And so I am so pleased and, and not surprised, but thrilled that you have in that same uh, diligent, deliberate, determined manner, identified wonderful co-conveners to succeed you and to um, whomever it was who, who mentioned, I think it was Billy. It's a, great, it's a great skill to create an entity, to root it so that it can continue and continue to thrive even as you move to a new role within it or beyond it. And so I, I just commend you and I celebrate uh, the passing the torch to Cynthia and Kemba, uh, having had a chance to see them over the years and to know that they are up to the uh, challenge and will take us to a new uh, frontier. And we thank you for your love and your leadership and wish you all the best in all the things we know you're going to continue to do. It's not like you're, you're, you're uh, going away. You're just going to be in a, in a different place. So God bless you and, and uh, Cynthia and Kemba. 
Thank you so very much, uh, Cynthia. And let's bring up a man up in here. Y'all gonna think, people gonna think this Justice Roundtable was just women, just women. I mean, that's all right too, but Udi, Udi, I see you all up down in there. Let's bring up Udi from the ACL. Yeah, Udi. Oh my God, oh my God. I've, I've like, I've been nonstop crying basically for the last 20 minutes. This is such a beautiful space that you've created. Um, I... You know, I've been following, I've been following your career for so long, all of your writing, your thinking, your doing. But the first time I really got to meet you was in 2018, when you asked me to come speak before the Justice Roundtable. For me, that was like the equivalent of being sent to the Pope, like to be able to like present. And, and I was so nervous. I was so intimidated. Um, but you were, as always, a guide. And, 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 and someone I've looked up to, and as I've gotten to know you, um, realizing even more your brilliance. My favorite, my favorite exchanges with you are um, when I say something and you're like, yeah, that's nice, Udi, but I actually had that idea 20 years ago. And I'm like, yes, you did, <laughs> that is true. Um, 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 so I echo what everyone has said, you have changed this country. There is nothing that has happened on criminal justice reform on the federal level in the last, I don't know, 15 years um, or more that you were in the force behind. Um, um, and you've never gotten enough recognition for that. Um, but in this space, you see how everyone does acknowledge that and recognize it and loves you so much. It is so inspiring to feel the love, to see the love and to be able to be one small part of it. Um, Kemba and Cynthia, I've gotten to know you um, more recently from my ACLU days. My God, I am so excited for everything that you are going to do together. Um, um, so this is this is one of those moments of like sadness and pride, but also excitement. Um, so thank you for everything that you have done. Um, um, the nation is grateful. I'm so grateful. Um, and I can't wait to see what more will happen. Thank you so very much, Udi, and thank you for all that you have done and all that you do. Um, I want to bring up um, uh, Mark Osler next, and then Kanye Bennett. Uh, Mark, uh, where are you? Wait a minute, hold on. Let me. I'm right the, here. <laughs> the techie thing. There you go, Mark Osler. Mark, ah, another part. Uh, <laughs> this is this is quite a day. I mean, um, a, a great person. Uh, has led this and great people are going to continue to lead it. But, but Nikichi, you, you really changed my entire career. You did what you've done with so many other people, which is that uh, you reached out to me and read something that I'd written and said, we need to work together, even though we were very different. I was a former prosecutor, um, you know, somebody who, who was coming at it from a different angle with a different set of experiences, but that made us all the stronger. And um, I know that in the end, 100 years from now, there's a lot of people I know right now who are wealthy or somewhat famous, but there's few who will have changed the world, who have really changed the trajectory of people's lives. And you're one of those people. Oh, Mark, thank you so very much. That means so much um, to me coming from you. And you're right, it was that, um, it was the teaming up, our teaming up, that really helped to put this clemency uh, issue on, on the map. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just teary-eyed. Thank you, thank you, Mark. I wanna bring up Kanye Bennett next, and hold on, let me do the techie thing. And Kanye, Kanye, Kanye Bennett with the Bell Project, formerly with the ACLU, formerly with the Constitution Project, formerly with uh, <laughs> oh, over there, up there in Congress. Talk to us, Kanye. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nikichi, Nikichi, thank you for creating this space for us to celebrate you. You know, you always stress that this work is bigger than any one person, that it's the life blood of these working groups that keeps this Justice Roundtable going, that it's really sort of this collective effort, this effort of community. But Nikichi, we would not be here. This movement would not be here. The things that we have been able to accomplish in Washington would not have happened if it were not for you. As Jocelyn has shared, as Mark just shared, you have changed this world, Nikishi. 
you really have. And I know we all are committed and, and pledged to continue this work and this legacy under the leadership of, of Kemba and, and Cynthia, who we also love and appreciate dearly. Like Sakira and Nicole have already shared, you've not only poured into community, but you have poured into each of us individually. Again, we would not be here without you, Nikichi. I know personally and professionally, I would not be where I am today if it were not for you. You sort of <laughs> gave the, the roster of organizations that I have worked for during my time here. And Nikichi, really, it is because of your mentorship, because of your love, um, because of your sort of, um, you know, warm embrace at that first Justice Roundtable when I was a fellow with Mr. Conyers, um, that, I, that I am here. And so I, again, just want to lift you up, lift you up, Nikichi, and know that we we support you in your, your next step on this journey. And we will, we will be here making sure that we do not disappoint in terms of keeping the, the Justice Roundtable going. So thank you, Nikichi. I, I, I share the sentiments that everyone has conveyed. You mean so much to us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kanye. You know, I love you forever, always and forever. Uh, let me bring up Chris Scott here. <laughs> oh, my brother. Chris, where are we at? Spotlight. Chris Scott from Open Society. How you doing, Chris? Hey, Nikichi. I'm good. So, you know, it's like a bittersweet moment, right? I echo everything that everybody has said. And I'll just say, you know, when mm -hmm. I met you, what, 13 years or so ago, it was you know, Eugene, Sean, who allowed me the opportunity and space to be at um, Open Society. And I think over the years, through the good, the bad, the ugly, you've always helped, you know, create a space and maintain the space of privilege that we have, right? And by that, I mean, it's the one thing that you told me when I first came on board at OSF was, you know, it's not pretty, it's not ugly, but you have to be able to sacrifice your own wants and needs to make a difference. Um, in that place, in the world, et cetera. And that's the one thing that's always stuck with, stuck with me, right? And so I think it's the thing that, you know, you've always been in the back of my head as we do this work and as we engage on this work to make a difference is that it's not about us. It's not about anything else but the work and the sacrifice we have to put in. And for 19 years, you've done that. And you've done it in such a tremendous, profound way and touched so many lives that I hope that we can all continue the great legacy that you put forth and follow in your passion and leadership in understanding what sacrifice looks like to make a difference and do it for the betterment and the better and, and, and the greater good for others. And so with that, you know, I appreciate you. You'll always have a special place in my heart. My family loves you. You know, if my kids were here, they would know your voice. Sarah just said, oh, that's Nikichi. And so, you know, um, it is something that I hope that as we move forward and as we continue under the leadership of both Cynthia and Kimba, we can all be proud and, and, and not forget the sacrifices you made and make our own sacrifices for the greater good of this work and for others who are not privileged enough to sit in these spaces and allow the community, particularly those who are directly impacted, to really be leaders in this space and in this work. So with that, I thank you for all that you've done for everybody, for all that you've done for me, and just teaching me the very importance of self-sacrifice and being selfless in this work, because you've done it for so long. And we want to give you your flowers and your blessings while you're here. So best believe there's going to be, I'm pretty sure folks are going to pull together some celebratory piece for you and send you off um, in style. So, but thank you for all your contributions and your work in this space and what you've taught us over the years. And I'd be remiss if I say, you know, I remember those long nights and days, me, Andrew, Jasmine, and even when Takira was a fellow pulling together the Justice Roundtable letters, um, creating the templates for the Roundtable assembly, ver you know, email letters that me and Andrew had to manage and pull together and then born into the website and into the Roundtable assembly. So it's great to see your vision come to fruition and the legacy be carried on um, that so many of us contributed to, but through your leadership we're able to really find our own vision and our own selves in that work. So thank you, Nikichi. Thank you so very much, Chris. And thank you for your boldness and for your brilliance and for your authenticity. 
All right. So um, wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, Queen Karen, Karen Garrison, Queen Karen Garrison. Come on, let me spotlight you. And you are, we got to make it a little bit because we're supposed to still have our, I don't know, maybe we won't today, but our um, working group updates. But Queen Karen, talk to us. Mommy activists and sons. Oh! Thank you so much. You know, I want to congratulate uh, Cynthia and Kimba, but mostly to congratulate you, Nikichi, because you know, you're all so special to me and you've been through so much with me that I know you allowed me to go through so many things with you, you know, and uh, I, I think, I know that Angela and Frazier brought me to the, the first justice round table or something I came to. And then the next time she was out of town, she said, can you go there? I said, yeah. And it was something so new to me, but I've never been made, uh, to feel like I didn't belong there because I wasn't professional or something like that. But because of my impact, you allowed me, as you have always allowed people to enter into the realm uh, displaying their qualities. That's something about you that you can, you know where to put somebody, you know where to tell them to go and allow them to do things. I, I, you know, you let me do a lot of things with you and I didn't understand, I asked all questions, you answered all of them for me in a way that I could understand and keep it moving. And one thing, you know, that you gave, the last thing that you gave that I read without stopping was this. <laughs> and, you know, I read it because I knew it was you. And when it says the audacious quest for justice, and, and, and that's what it was, and that's what it still is, you know, but I, I want to congratulate you on the courage to move on and hit, the, so hit the ground running and keep on going and also to know that you can leave something somewhere and you it took two people but it'll take two or more to do what you do it's like ashley's sack i read in history they had this uh, a sack you know for the slaves that they carried it'll take more than two to fill that sack but it'll keep being as you passed it on to two that are capable of doing so so i thank you so much and your next book should be on five minute naps because you know, I used to tease you about the electricity you had. And that five minute nap, you take a five minute nap, it would do, I think it would take me eight hours to come back as strong. So, you know, I'm always there with you, Nikichi, no matter what. And I thank you so much for allowing me to come up and speak. Thank you so much. Love say you always. Clubhouse, hey, look, as they say on Clubhouse, I'm Queen Karen G and I'm complete for now. <laughs> well, you will really never be complete and we really appreciate the role that you have played over the years in helping to educate legislators in terms of your sons who are unjustly illegally incarcerated and when they came out they were part of this whole movement but again thank you queen karen garrison thank you all right um jumana 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 musa n-a-c-d-l jumana i don't see how to I don't know why I don't see how to bring you. Um, here it is. Jumana, Jumana Musa talked to us. Briefly. And briefly, but Nikichi, I don't know if you saw on the chat, I made a motion. It's been second and thirded and fifted. Oh, I haven't this, checked the chat. Well, we all agree these are today's updates. You're getting oh. all the flowers. <laughs> and updates can be done later, but you're not going to shorten this. Because <laughs> I will say, like, obviously, I was not ready to be on camera today, but I can't not take this opportunity to say that I was one of the many people who was raised up in my advocacy at the criminal justice roundtable from when I was at Amnesty working on racial profiling. That was a long time ago. And, you know, I'm saying what everybody says and what everybody knows, but you really are visionary, right? And creating this space and bringing it together and shepherding it in a way that, you know, it's funny, you were talking to a car earlier about how you wanted to talk about crack cocaine disparity and that car and the sensing project brought it legitimacy, but I think it's the opposite, which is you've always operated not just from a place that invested in people's humanity, but from a perspective of liberation and abolition, and you've never compromised on that. And what you've done is you've brought, you know, the so-called mainstream to you, to that vision, to the one that moves us forward to real freedom, right? which means so much more than, you know, somebody gets out or a law gets changed, but really sort of the vision of what that future looks like. And, you know, I think that is something that cannot be, it can't be talked about enough because it is not a small thing to have that vision, but to have that vision and then be able to implement it and bring people into it and then multiply it is something that I don't think anybody but you could have done. And I think sometimes we have these moments where we look at the structure that we have all been a part of, that we have all benefited from, 
and not just us who sort of meet <laughs> or do advocacy, but you know, the people whose, whose lives have been changed from the work and the leadership. And you think to yourself, like, how does this exist past Nikichi, right? Um, and then as soon as you said, Kemba and Cynthia's name, I'm like, that's exactly how this exists, past Nikichi, right? And Kemba, like, I don't know you personally. I have, I have sort of, <laughs> I've known you parallel, right? I've, I've watched you, I've read you, I've heard you. Um, and, you know, it, it, people have already talked up your accomplishments, including just raising whole successful human beings. And so congratulations on that. And Cynthia, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with you when you, when you were running Clemency 2014. And it was, um, you know, I feel really, really confident in all of this going forward, because I think we have two people who still bring, who bring that same liberation ideology, the same abolition ideology, and the same radical commitment to humanity. And so I'm looking forward to it. And I know somebody else said it earlier, I think maybe it was Angeline. Those of you who know me know that I don't say this, you know, just to say it, but Black women need to lead and I will follow them anywhere. And I think we are in good hands going from Nikichi to Cynthia and Kemba. And I'm I'm just grateful for the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you so very much, Jemana. Thank you always. Love you so much. Um, and yeah, I am definitely going to be saving the chat, so I'll be able to read everything. But it's glad to hear. So we'll just keep rolling. We won't do our um, working group updates, if that's OK. Um, let me bring up Kyle. I see Kyle at, at O'Dowd. Again, it's not just women or even Black women. We have all spectrums here. So, Cal, come on. Let me uh, add your spotlight. There you go. NACDL you go. again in the house. So, so the, the, yeah, speaking for middle aged white men, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Well, um, Nikichi, uh, we knew this day would come, but it doesn't make it any less painful. Um, you are absolutely a champion of justice um, from the perspective of NACDL. Um, and you're going to get our large piece of glass that we gave you um, just a couple months ago. Uh, of course, um, a lot of people have said that we wouldn't be here without you. That is absolutely true. Um, all of our groups are powerless. We're nothing without each other. Even behemoths like the ACLU can't pass legislation without help. You have given us a coalition. You have given us unity. Um, you have given us real power uh, in Congress to get things done. Um, and uh, Nikichi, even though you're an advocate on the outside, I know that the core of you is a criminal defense lawyer. You are someone who knows what it's like to stand up with someone who is hated by the community, facing the awesome power of an awful power of prosecutors, uh, facing judges who at every turn uh, try to stymie you. Um, and that has given me great confidence in your leadership throughout the years. Uh, at every, uh, in every instance where maybe NACDL had to take a, a slightly different position uh, from maybe the mainstream uh, groups, uh, you have understood, you have helped explain our position um, and, and made us feel welcome nonetheless. Um, so uh, it is, uh, I, I'm very happy to see uh, Kemba stepping up. Um, I have uh, been inspired by you since my days at Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Um, Cynthia, all I can say is, I, I don't understand why we don't get a vote on this, but I guess, no, I'm just, you, you know I love you. Cynthia and I are old uh, sweet mates and um, sometimes tease each other rather cruelly, and that will certainly continue as you are in the spotlight here. Um, it will only probably get worse. So, but thank you for stepping up nonetheless. Um, I look forward to, to years of working with, with both of you um, and uh, continued uh, help from Nikichi, of course. Thank you so very much, Kyle. And thank you for National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers for this phenomenal champion justice award that I got in, in October from your organization. Thank you. Um, I want to bring up Chrissy Roth from Amnesty International, followed by Amy Pova from the Can Do uh, uh, Foundation. So Chrissy, let me, there we go. Chrissy, uh, who co-chairs our law enforcement reform working group. Well, I will have to second what Kyle had said that even though we knew the state was coming, it doesn't make that we are prepared for it. Um, Nikichi, like so many others, when I started in this work and I didn't initially start with criminal justice, 
as soon as I got to the issue, people were like, you need to talk to Nikichi. And beyond that, people were like, well, she started at the ACLU and that wasn't radical enough for her. And then she went to <laughs> OSF and that wasn't enough for her either. So she made her own road. And so I really much feel like you have so much the embodiment of be of recognizing beyond the four walls that we sit in these institutions that we represent that in theory, we give them power and they you know, elevate these incredible ideas that we have as advocates. You've showed us that that doesn't actually matter most of the time. And for so many of us, we're only able to accomplish in part because of the institutions we work for, but you really have created something special and unique here and welcoming and loving this beloved community. And you know, while of course, yes, there are people welcoming who are not black women, I feel particularly um, grateful for the opportunity to serve in as a co-chair among so many impressive and wonderful black women to be mentored by them. So I am very sad that I have not been able to spend as much time with you as I would like as a younger co-chair in the group, but I'm sure you won't be getting rid of me just yet. <laughs> and I can, I look forward to continuing to work with and learn from Cynthia and Kimba, this is the first time I'm meeting you, but I look forward to, to working with you as well. And I'll leave it there because I'm sure we have more folks that want to talk, but thank you so much for all that you have done and all of your incredible accomplishments are so very inspiring. Thank you so very much, uh, Chrissy, and just thank you for the great role that you play in leading one of the Justice Roundtable working groups. Uh, that's the Amy, Amy Popa from the Can Do Foundation. Amy, who um, really is the person who um, supplied a lot of the names that I used for that very first slam dunk clemency whatever it was extravaganza that we had when we brought everybody to the White House and we did this to that or the other. So again, thank you very much, um, Amy, for that. Just not just that role, all of the roles you've been playing. So talk to us very briefly. I know, I know. I can be long-winded, so I'm going to make it real short. I'm probably the only one on this panel where my um, uh, come do it starts with Kimba. And Kimba, I don't know if you remember this, but I was standing outside EF. You and I were standing there talking. It was the first time that we really connected eye to eye. And you were telling me about how you had an offer for some media exposure, but you were waffling about, you know, what that does sometimes to the family to be thrown into um, the spotlight with media. And um Anyway, we had this kind of almost naked conversation where both of us are kind of standing there looking at one another, wondering, how are we going to get back home? You know, it's just, it's, it's like a tragic moment, but some memories are solidified um, for some reason in your brain. And I'll, I'll never forget that, that moment where there was a connection, like just, you had 24 years, I got 24 years, and we just were like, you know, I, giving one another some kind of sustenance. So fast forward, we're both home. <laughs> and that's how uh, Nikichi and Cynthia, all three of you women came literally full bloom into my life with CP14, because I was just sort of like a little, just a little hermit in my house, you know, with my little website, and that's it. And Kimba, um, you know, introduced Nikichi to me via the Ramona Brandt story. And um, you were talking about doing something at the White House. And um, so you got on my website and you showed Nikichi when Ramona came walking out. And then somehow Andrea James also told me that Nikichi wanted to do this clemency summit. And I love your creativity, Nikichi. You always think outside the box. And Cynthia, you were such a huge name that I was just like, I've got to meet her. I've got to meet her. <laughs> and then because of... Nikichi bringing us all to DC and making magic happen for Ramona and Kimba and everybody who got to have lunch with um, President Obama, all because of your creativity, all because of thinking, you know, you wanted to do this. And I'm sure there were other people um, uh, who were uh, inspiring you that you knew you could do this because your sister Cynthia and you go way back. I didn't know all of that until I got to come to DC. And I feel like I've just been part of this sisterhood ever since with this ongoing effort to get people home through clemency, which as somebody said earlier, this work is hard. It's uh, living your PTSD over and over and over again, as Kimba has pointed out, because we can't really, uh, we can't really um, enjoy our freedom 
because we're so obsessed with getting people like Michelle West home and everything like that. And that's it, because I'm going to just start bawling. But thank you so much. This is the perfect um, baton pass to Kimba and Cynthia. And I look so forward to working with you guys in the future. I really think wonderful things are going to happen. And thank you, Nikichi. I thank love you, you, Amy. We love you for always you all. forever. Yes, indeed. I see Anna has her hand raised, but doesn't want to come on screen. So Anna from the Church of Scientology, if you can speak from where you are. Sure. I don't okay. mind coming on screen, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> oh, I was going to do it for you. They said you didn't want to come on screen. Let me, I can't find you now. Wait a minute. Oh, Lord. But go on and start talking. When I find you, I'll bring it you on screen. It was ugly screen. because it was before and I was ugly crying and definitely didn't want to be on camera at the time. <laughs> Oh, no, I know. I can't bring you on screen unless your picture, your face is showing, not an avatar. Yeah, so, yeah, so just talk from where you are. Okay. Unless, yeah, I can't bring an avatar. Well, well, there's no prompt for me to do that. It's okay. I don't want to take up the time with the technicalities. I probably pressed something wrong before, but um, Kichi, I definitely was crying earlier and didn't want to be on camera because uh, it's so bittersweet. Oh, there we go. Join us, panelists. Some... Oh, did you join? I think I did. I think we all uh, did. No, okay. I don't. But just go on and talk because I don't see you. I don't see a thing for me to bring you on. So I don't. So I think we're all on. So hopefully, uh, as long as you can hear me, I'll keep we talking. Can hear you. Okay. Okay. So I just I wanted to speak up earlier, but again, I was tearing up because it's so bittersweet. And compared to many here, I am not a veteran at all. I've been on criminal reform for a few years, uh, but I've been hearing about Nkichi a lot longer than I've been participating in criminal reform myself because my colleague John Stannard, who is a long-term member of the roundtable, he, could, he couldn't be here today. He's going to be devastated, but I'll, I'll let him know what happened. He has been talking about you and Nkichi since probably day one of his attendance at the roundtable, and he has been talking about you with the utmost admiration and enthusiasm. And I was intrigued from the first time. I was like, OK, who is this Kichi? I got to see and hear her. And the first time I did, uh, it definitely was obvious why, why you're such a star and why John was so enamored. I will definitely be echoing others when I say that you are a big inspiration and that you have created an amazing space and a fantastic legacy. But for me personally, I can also say one of the biggest thing about you that has been an inspiration is your uh, relentless optimism and cheerfulness, because I am sure that in your long career and long path through criminal reform, you've seen tons of disappointments and failures and you have somehow you managed not to become cynical or insensitive you just retained your optimism which is incredibly contagious and in the best way possible and i just uh, i am looking up to you in that regard because you make everything look absolutely easy and possible as long as you have the will and friends everything can be done and i truly believe in that having been part of the justice roundtable now for several years and now you're even a bigger inspiration because i believe that leading and leaving are probably both equally hard things and you're passing the torch to amazing people with kimba and cynthia we're going to be all in very good hands and i wish you all the best and congratulations and thank you so much for who you are and what you're doing and i hope you're not disappearing entirely and we'll be seeing and hearing <laughs> from you i'll never disappear entirely <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, to give a shout out to John uh, for me. I appreciate that. I want to bring on now. Uh, I hope his picture is showing now. I gotta now. I gotta bring the grid back up. Y'all know who I'm talking about. That little scrap of paper. Oh man, I can't find my my I my the the <laughs> the, 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 the <sighs> William Money. Where, where are you? There you are. <laughs> I gotta bring up, oh gosh, wait a minute. The thing keeps slipping. Oh, it, they, oh you can't, you, you appear magically. I didn't even press the button. <laughs> I 
Underwood. Talk to us, my brother. Wow, wow, wow. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Can I say, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be on. You know, I'll be 68 next week, but Kara can tell you, most of the time, I act like I'm 12 and she's got to rein me in, you know. <laughs> got me running to the Congress and the Senate and, oh, man, listen, a long time, a long, long, long time. And uh, like Amy said, you know, that's really true, you know. You are. I didn't realize that's what it was till she said it, you know, she relived the trauma over and over of all the good people you left behind, you know. And uh, but I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to help some other people who need help. You know, we should be home. Male and female should be home, you know, and uh, yeah, this is incredible. You are incredible. Man, my children, you inspired my kids. You know, and they, you and them together came and got me. And uh, everybody that's been in that place know, you know, you, you can't really put too much hope in freedom because it's so long and coming. So you just live every day and just, and especially where I was, you know, you live every day with praying that you don't do something stupid because you run into mind, you know, uh, minds all day long, you know, explosive situations all day, every day from staff and prisoners alike. And uh, yeah. So when I did, when the, uh, so funny, when the uh, unit manager unlocked my door doing count time, when I turned around and saw her, she said, come on, come go with me. I said, well, where are we going? She said, come on, you got to go. You got to go. Go where? Because the first thing came to my mind, this is COVID. They're trying to move me from the institution. It's a Friday night. I won't be able to tell anybody. I can't get to the phone. You know? She said, no, you're going home. You're going home. I'm going home. Where am I going? I, I, I don't believe her. And uh, so fortunately, we go in the back and my case manager is back there. Because her and I, are, I'm literally, literally arguing with her. I'm not going anywhere without my pictures and, and my legal work. She said, no, no, you got to go. You got to get out of here anyway. All of this, to make a long story short, is because of you. Because of you. You know? Because you didn't, you didn't tell me no and never told me no. I don't think you know how to say no to anybody. You know, you never say no. And uh, Wow. With all the problems in your life, you still never say no to people. And uh, you know, all of us, you know, and, and, I, and I thought sat here and I just, you know, because I am a guy that came from, from, uh, from the streets into everything else. And Kara uh, can tell you my, my economics is my, <laughs> it's my focal point. <laughs> so and the only thing I could say to sum it all up is that for if anybody made two dollars in their work in this work here, anybody who's ever made two dollars in this work, they definitely owe you a dollar. So if they made two dollars, they definitely owe you a dollar. <laughs> That's the reality of this situation here. God bless you, but God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Happy All the rest of you, but man, Kichi, God bless you. Wow. This is you are Thank why you. we do this work, Bill Underwood. Man. Listen. You are why all of us do this work but, that uh, we do. So thank you man. for everything that you are. And thank you for everything that you've done since you've been out. You ain't even been out a year. And you haven't testified before Congress, been to the White House, the Department of Justice, just all over the place, you know, hobnobbing with, with you know, <laughs> the whole spectrum, making things change. Thank well, you. That's, that's because of you. It's it's because of you and you all. And like Amy said, that you know, that PTSD is real. How the hell can I sit down and rest? And I know people in there suffering. People in there that might never see home might die in there, you know, because of the, you know, the games that they're playing, the politics of this whole thing. 
you know it's, it's you know that's the yeah. sad thing you know it's nearly never really about the law it's not about what they did it's the politics mm -hmm. that's really that's all it is the politics yeah. you know yeah. so you know that's what we all are fighting the politics mm -hmm. you know so the it's politics. like you said yesterday at the uh you know they're talking about why should there even be a conversation about people that are out on, under the cares act what is that you know it's, but it's the politics the whole thing so that keeps us from talking about the real issues about the people that's been in for 40 years and 30 something years and 20 something years and their kids got kids who have kids and they can't see you know and they're forgotten so Bill, you know, but anyway you. i'm sorry you know no I'm it's all good but we want to wish you a you know, happy you, early you know, birthday man, I got a brand new life because week. of you all. Thank you. We love you. I got a brand new life because of you all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm love happy. You. I'm a better man for it. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to see me cry. I don't it cry like this in jail. Good. I didn't cry for 30 something years. I didn't cry. <laughs> <laughs> you on camera crying. Man, Jesus it's Christ. <laughs> man. And Kimber started it. Amy and Jesus. <laughs> Man. See, that's why also it's so very important that we have um, someone who's directly impacted that is a co-convener uh, as well. This is something that we've never had. And then we're just so grateful that uh, Kimba has stepped up, uh, you know, to uh, the plate because I have not been, I have not walked in those shoes, Cynthia Roseberry, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And um, it is critical that folk who have walked in those shoes or at the leadership of uh, uh, of advocacy that is talking about um, changing those shoes. So I'm going to remove your spotlight and bring somebody else on. Thank you. Thank love you. you so much. And love you all. You. Love you, Nikichi. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think I saw Jody, Jody Kent Lobby, uh, another OG of Justice Roundtable. Hey, Gosh. Jody, talk to us. I don't know how okay, to follow Mr. Mr. Underwood, um, but thank you, Mr. Underwood, for those words and um, for your courage and, and relentless advocacy. And I, um, I just want to say, Nikichi, over the last more than 15 years, you have demonstrated what it looks like to lead with unrelenting love, um, courage, passion, and humility. All of those things, such rare characteristics in Washington, D.C. And I think, you know, what we heard earlier, you know, and Kara described the culture that you've created in this coalition, mm -hmm. one where people care about one another, one where we're lifting each other up and really working together to get things done. Um, not to say that there isn't conflict, not to say there isn't drama, but you have led us through that successfully. You in a town that is arguably the most toxic in, <laughs> of any in the world, have created something that is a force for change. And, you know, when Jess said that you are, you have changed the world, uh, it is through that kind of leadership. And I'm just so grateful um, that you have been able to model that for all of us. And may we, you know, learn from you and continue to try to, uh, uh, you know, adopt those characteristics and continue to be change makers. Um, you know, in 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 uh, the ways that you have shown us, um, I, I think the fact that no matter who you call, they show up. Like I know that no matter what is going on, if Nikichi calls, it's like you show up. It doesn't matter if it's somebody on the hill, uh, you know, if it's a grassroots organizer, if it's a conservative ally. Like Nikichi calls, you show up. Um, because you have just demonstrated how to get things done and how to do it in a way that is so authentic and so um, loving and, and, and genuine and humble. Uh, herding cats like this coalition is often a thankless job. <laughs> and the truth is, and God bless you, Kemba and Cynthia, for taking that on. <laughs> um, we appreciate you. And I promise uh, when you call, we will show up. Um, but thank you, Nikichi. Uh, you know, you've just been an extraordinary uh, mentor and leader. And uh, I'm just so happy for you. Let us pour into you in this next chapter uh, of your of your life, because uh, we all owe you a deep of gratitude. Thank you so very much, Jody. And you really, you have shown us how to pass on the torch. So thank you for your example and everything that you've done. Um, I saw Jenny Collier. I saw her a minute ago. And I'm here. I, I, okay, oh, wait a minute. You, this thing jumps around. I'm trying to um, do your spotlight. 
you, 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 I know you're there because I heard you. Oh, just start talking. Oh, there you are. Okay, there you are. There we are. And as well, Jenny Collier, co chairs of the Entry Working Group. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Nikichi. Hey, Cynthia. Hey, Kemba. First, I wrote you a long note in the chat, which I will not reread about how you impacted every team member at Collier Collective, but in particular me and my enormous gratitude to you. But it also occurred to me that, you know, you have really given us the soundtrack to our lives and work through this community. You know, you come onto a Justice Roundtable meeting and there's always music. You go to a Nikichi event, there's always music. She sets the tone with her music. She sets the vibe. And you really set the beat for us through your leadership. You give us the heart needed for our advocacy like a song. And through the Justice Roundtable, <clears throat> generations of people will keep singing through their advocacy. Thank you, Nikichi. Thanks to Kemba and Cynthia for being the next act. And I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Jenny. Thank you for all that you've done to bring value to what I what I do. Uh, let's call them Akua. Akua, I don't know if you pronounce that Akua or Akua from Center for uh, American Progress. Let me see. Um, uh, 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 okay, no, I don't see you. Um, okay, I'm not quite sure if you're still there. I think you have to. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you have to talk because unless your picture shows up, I can't bring you um, to the spotlight. So go on and talk to us, Akua. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'll just make this um, very brief, but um, I've been working with the Center for American Progress for almost two years now um, through our criminal justice reform um, team. And right away, um, I was placed on the um, Justice Roundtable listservs and saw all the great work that this organization is doing and continues to do. Um, I'm very sad to hear this <laughs> news about you transitioning, Nikichi, but I'm very excited for the future ahead. And thank you so much for building this platform for us all to come together and um, combine our great work and efforts through this um, opportunity, this organization. I've built many connections um, that will further my career personally and will help me um, to advocate for um, justice impact individuals in the best way possible. So I thank you so much for all that you've done. Um, Cynthia and Kemba, I'm excited to be continue uh, this work with you all and um, under your leadership. And thank you for, um, for everything and for, for building this platform for us to continue our great work. All right, thank you so very much, Akua. And so glad that you're part of the Justice Roundtable. Uh, Deontay Brooks? Deontay Brooks. I, 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 Hi, how are you? Good, great, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for all of your work that you have done on behalf of so many of us. Uh, sad to see you go. Your work is certainly, uh, as I put in the chat, you have embodied, let your work speak for me, but excited to uh, see what's to come with Cynthia and Kimba. Uh, it was actually Cynthia who invited me to the round table. And Kimba, as a person who has uh, been in your shoes, I appreciate having you uh, as one of the co-leaders, knowing that that means that our voice will be heard. So uh, Nikichi, good luck in whatever you are going to do next. I know it's going to be great. And I look forward to the work that's going to continue to be done on behalf of the Justice Roundtable. And whatever I could do, I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. And I think I saw Vicky, Vicky Casanova. Uh... Willis, hey. uh, my sister, and yes. we a judge in an international tribunal. <laughs> I was helping to yes. Did I bring yes. you one more? Yeah, wait a minute, hold on. I add spotlight. Oh, cost me my okay. job. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that no. happened at the same hey. time. Oh my God, what's going it's on? It's a here? real thing. And not, not just my job, but it's pertinent to what I want to say here. First of all, thank you so okay, much. I don't see for your picture. Everything. I don't see your picture. Do, do we see yeah. screen? Okay, I don't know why uh, I don't, but that's okay. I can hear you. Go who on. knows? It's yeah, okay. good. So I just wanted to say, you know, echo what everyone has said. You know, thank you so much for being a true freedom fighter and a cultural warrior and educator, you know, and just for sharing your spirit um, 
for justice. But but our recent experience is that you know this is work that a lot of people don't, not everybody wants to to see succeed, right? So this you know two decades and then even the the strategic next step planning to ensure the next two decades are you know continuing on an upward trajectory is just is a powerful um, powerful way to move. And thank you for that. Cynthia and Kimba, you have all the support that I can muster. And also, um, I just want to shout out to um, so many, many, many members of the US Human Rights Network, which even though it um, curiously paused its work recently, um, just on the eve of the We Still Charge Genocide Tribunal, um, noting that there are political prisoners. It's so interesting, again, to hear Mr. Underwood say it's about, it's a political thing. So um, we're all gonna continue to fight. I'm really, I can't tell you how um, impactful it was for me to be invited during the Clemency as Justice um, events for the round table. That really was my most direct immersion into a number of days of, um, participating in and watching the magic that is in Kichi Taifa and the Justice Roundtable family and circle. And I know that it will, will only um, continue and grow based on this strong foundation. Human rights is so critical. We, we have lots of treaty reviews that are coming up just next year. And these testimonies that we're hearing even today have to be there. So um, thank you for everything. Thank you so very much, Vicki. And actually, it's because of your husband, uh, Stan Willis, that um, gave me the inspiration mm -hmm. to hold that hearing, the, uh, 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 to pursue the Inter-American Commission on, on Human Rights to hold that hearing we had on mandatory minimum sentences and crack cocaine. I write about that in my memoir. I've been meaning to tell you that. You're, he's saying it's up in there, so we'll talk about that. So thank you. Um, he's very, very proud of you. Very proud. <laughs> Okay, so I, I think we're about to come to a close. I see just a couple more. I just want to see if they want to speak. I see Lauren Case. I see Vaughn Legrand. Le Le and I see someone with a 240 <laughs> phone number. And I think I would have covered everybody. Lauren, did you want to um, uh, say anything? Or Ron Legrand? Le Ron, I see your microphone is off. So um, I don't see your picture, so I can't bring you on. But Ron Legrand uh, with Fair and Just Prosecution. I think he's consulting with them. Ron, can you hear me? Yeah, Nikichi, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. I, you know, I've held off on saying anything because I am so proud of, of all three of these beautiful sisters that I'm looking at. Nikichi, you've been an outstanding leader. And just another example of your leadership, you, you exercised the, the, the vision, the forethought to think in terms of successes. And you know, a history with some of our organizations, leaders do not think in terms of succession planning, but you do. And you couldn't have picked two more outstanding individuals in Kimba. Kimba, I met you when I was working with Bobby Scott in the judiciary. I think you had just uh, recently uh, come back home met you and your son, and I got to tell you, I feel old when you talk about your son <laughs> graduating. And Cynthia, you know, words fail when I think of, of, you know, all the fabulous work that you've done, the, the friend that whom you've become. Uh, I have declared myself as the global president of the Cynthia Roseberry Fan Club. So <laughs> everybody knows that. But Nikichi, you know, we know that you're going to step down, but we also believe that you're not going very far. <clears throat> you know, you've created a, an amazing uh, entity in the Justice Roundtable. We all thank you and love you for the leadership that you have provided and that we know you will continue to provide. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, Kemba and Cynthia, you will always have my support and our support. God bless you all. God bless. Thank you so very much, Ron. I'm going to go to Lauren Case, and we're going to close off with someone who I hear is on the phone 
Dorothy Gaines. So that is just phenomenal. And I'm going to let Kimba and um, uh, 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 Cynthia say whatever little closing they want to say. And I'll just say, don't, don't leave because y'all know someone mentioned about the music. I'm going to turn off the Facebook Live and I'm going to turn on the music. We can just dance and, and say our goodbyes as we're heading off into to the next Zoom, shall we say. So Lauren Case, did you want to um to, to talk to us? I'll just be brief. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I will just say, I cannot put your book down. <laughs> I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I've been doing this work for a long time, but I'm new to the Justice Roundtable because I've I spent most of my life in the federal defenders. And so I love, and you know, sometimes those people, they, we just put our heads down and work, but they, we need to learn from advocates of all kinds. And so that has been a really wonderful education for me. Um, I, I, words fail me um, in describing what an incredible impact you've made. Um, Cynthia and Kemba, I just love that there's a justice impact person and a warrior uh, side by side leading this. And I really am excited um, to see how all of you change makers um, just tell us what to do and we'll be there. Thank you so much. I love that. Thank you so very much, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy Gaines, I understand that's you on the line. Can you unmute yourself? Dorothy is another one of the our OGs, people that we brought before a Congress. It was Dorothy Gaines uh, uh, whose story touched the heart of her senator, believe it or not, uh, and caused him to be a proponent of changing these crack cocaine laws. So Dorothy, are you able to unmute and just say a few words to us? Dorothy received clemency also from President Clinton at the end of his term. They said they must unmute her. Okay, I'm pressing the button that says ask to unmute. And I don't know what to do. Let me see, ask to unmute, do it again. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. For a while, your people on the phone can unmute. What's Cynthia Robin saying? I can't read that. The people on the phone. People on the phone. And I'm about pressing, pressing star it. six. Dorothy Gates, if you're able to press star six, because I want to end with you, I think she must have. Oh, to press it again, star six. Or do I press star six? Okay, I see you're off of mute. Talk to us, Dorothy. Is, is your volume up? Okay, she's not on mute. Well, yes, she is on mute. Okay, so <laughs> I, I don't know how to do the techie to, to bring that about, uh, Dorothy, but we love and honor and respect you and all and everything that you have been uh, through with your personal trials and, and tribulations, but the advocacy that you have brought in terms of touching the hearts and minds of Congress to be about changing some of these laws, we are forever forever grateful to you, uh, Dorothy Gaines. Um, and so with that, uh, Kimba and uh, Cynthia, Kimba, I'll go start with you. This time, if you have any closing uh, words you want, might want to uh, say, you all will officially start January <laughs> uh, first. And um, I just want to say the round table is however you want to make and shape it. Doesn't have to be what I've done. You know, it's time for new creativity, new energy. So. Kimba talk to us and then Cynthia. Thank you, Chi. I just am overwhelmed with um, hearing everyone's testimony. And um, again, with God's timing of everything. And um, you said we'll start in January. I know I'm going to uh, woo saw during this holiday season and do um, self care because what Amy and some of the other formerly incarcerated uh, people have said the, the PTSD and along with um, the full-time job that I'm still doing and reading, you know, these cases, um, 
I'm, I'm just going to be fired up and uh, ready to go, Nikichi. And I'm looking forward to um, working with all the working groups. And I appreciate all the comments and the messages as far as, you know, everyone wanting to help us um, with this transition. And, um, you know, Nikichi, you know, we'll be talking to you to get, you know, uh, suggestions, feedback, um, getting caught up on um, the working groups as well. But I just want to um, take the time to thank everyone for the congratulations and um, my heart and passion is still very much on fire um, in wanting to end mass incarceration and, and bring our people home. And um, the weight is heavy. So I just encourage everyone to, again, during this holiday season to, you know, what Nikichi would always promote, um, it's making sure that you're, you're taking care of self first so that we can be ready to go um, the beginning of the year. And, um, you know, just uh, thank you both Nikichi and Cynthia, um, because I know when I called you all and, you know, was venting and wanting to share and it's just like, voila, God said, here you go. Um, so I look forward to um, working with the same people since, um, you know, because Nikichi, I was with you on this journey when the Justice Roundtable um, was uh, started. So I'm just excited to be able to uh, fulfill this opportunity and position. And I will be speaking for uh, the directly impacted people. So I, I appreciate those that made comments on the phone. And um, also with Dorothy not being able to unmute, Dorothy and I and Amy, we, we all received commutation um, from President Clinton. And, you know, some of the time we, we weren't even thinking about our own um, well being. And I know Dorothy would share certain stories, personal stories that was going on with her. but we knew that when Nikichi called or these organizations called, um, if we were able to, to be physically be wherever they needed us to be to speak for those that we left behind in prison, that we were gonna make it happen in spite of whatever struggles, journeys that you know we may have been going through. So um, again, Nikichi, just thank you. Um, I needed to hear everything because um, that has inspired me. And I just pray that God gives Cynthia and I um, the wherewithal, the, uh, the humanity, the um, connectedness to be able to tie together many different per personalities, ideologies, and it's not just Black women. We need all, all different types of allies in this movement. Um, so really looking forward to it. And thank you both so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so very much, Kimba. Thank you. Cynthia. Thank you, uh, Nikichi and Kimba, my new partner in crime, like Jessalyn and Nikichi. We'll be Jessalyn and Nikichi 2.0, I guess. You know, I just have to say that I'm so humbled that Nikichi would entrust me with, with um, this precious uh, baby that she gave birth to, you know, her child, her brainchild. And it's so humbling to know that Kimba would agree to allow me to step into this space with her, given uh, the honorable position she has for what she's endured. Um, and most uh, honored, uh, or the most way that I'm honored by this is that you, the members of the Justice Roundtable, who have been in the vineyard, who have labored, who have, who for decades, not just for a hot minute, uh, who have been here to do this work would allow me to come in and step alongside you shoulder to shoulder, soldier, shoulder to shoulder as we move, try to move the work forward. And most importantly, most importantly, for the people who are directly impacted, who have endured and continue to endure for the benefit of others, some people who will never know their name, it is a great honor to, to lead from behind in your shadow as you show us the way um, to hold America accountable for the sins that it is committing on brothers and sisters and to make America not what it said it is, but what it must be if it continues to say what it is. So I'm just so filled right now and so grateful to be able to step into this position. And I pledge to you 
that I will pour myself into this alongside Kimba and Nikichi will be there guiding us still and to continue the great work that you've done because we all know that there are so many more of our brothers and sisters that we have to liberate. And so that will propel us on and move us forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And just in closing. I just got just, unmuted. Who is that? Dorothy Gaines. Oh my God, Dorothy. I figured out what it was. I, there was um I, there were two telephone numbers and your I was unmuting the wrong one. Dorothy Gaines, perfect. Dorothy, talk to us, Dorothy Gaines. I just want to say that I'm proud of you, Latisha. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of your group. And I'm so thankful for the people that you're bringing on board. I'm uh, thankful that I'm able to talk today because I was strong away from COVID pneumonia. And I'm grateful to be on this line. I still have serious complications. I have a little fear for my fitness, but I'm thankful and thankful that I'm blessed and I'm living to be able to speak to y'all today because I was at death. Dorothy, we first of all, our deepest, 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 deepest sympathies for uh, the COVID pneumonia that you're currently recuperating from. Our prayers and our blessings are with you always. We wrap our arms around you, my sister. Thank you for being that shining, shining light. And I'm glad that we were able to hear your voice, my sister. Yes, and also I, I congratulate you, the teacher, for your journey. And I want you all to still keep my son. I'm still up in prayer. He's still doing time. All right. Yes. Yes, we're keeping we're keeping everybody in prayer, Dorothy. You're going in and out, so we didn't not hearing all of the words, but we can um feel your we can feel your spirit, my sister. Yes, and I want to also thank Karen for always keeping me out there and letting me know what's going on, even though she's had her trial from her son dying. But I just want to thank everybody that has always been in touch. Thank you all so much. Thank you so very much, Dorothy. And, you know, all of the working groups of the Justice Roundtable, I know uh, you have been very pivotal to the clemency uh, working group and the work that we did with respect to that, to the sentencing reform working group, to the reentry working group. See, all of these working groups, the drug policy working group, all, all these issues are interconnected. All of the dots are there, the pretrial uh, in courts working group, state issues working group, um, faith working group, they're directly impacted. Racial justice. I mean, it's it's the entry. I mean, it's all interconnected. And I'm passing the torch to Kimba and to Cynthia to just carry on. I just did not want the Justice Roundtable to die, and I just feel so very blessed and just so very inspired that it will continue on in whatever form or formation <laughs> uh, you decide uh, to take it. So um, at this point, I'm going to end the Facebook Live. I want to turn on the music. Let's have our Justice Roundtable playlist as we um, bring everybody on screen, as we uh, just say goodbye uh, to everyone. So view stream, stop live stream.